Okay, well, let's talk about the other side of memory, which is uh, how do you lose it? <laughs> and aside from amnesia, uh, most people lose their memory through a process of interference. Um, and this has really been a huge debate in the field, this kind of, do you lose memory as a result of kind of decay, some kind of natural uh, decaying process, or is, is it actually a result of interference from new learning? It's extremely hard to separate those two processes because both are things that operate over time. And it's very hard to have a situation when you're not doing new learning and therefore to kind of really have a pure decay uh, process uh, that's unaffected by a potential interference effect. However, in, if you look in the brain and you look at how individual synapses work, and we know, again, that these synapses are the underlying neural basis of memory, we can clearly see a signature of two different timescales of synaptic potentiation. And that's shown over here on the right, uh, that you have, uh, if you have a strong uh, neural activation here on the top panel or a weaker neural activation on the bottom panel, um, in both cases, there's a transient uh, level of uh, increase in synaptic potentiation of synaptic strength that decays roughly over 15 minutes to a half an hour uh, out into a more stable value. Um, and this is especially pronounced in the case where the initial encoding is, is kind of weaker, not this four uh, bursts of high frequency stimulation, but rather just two. Um, that really has this much more uh, pronounced decay back down uh, into this uh, low level here, either this is a chemical uh, manipulation here looking at protein synthesis. And the key result in this bottom panel here is that uh, when you block the ability of the neurons to, syn to synthesize new proteins, um, you actually get all the way back down to baseline. But even when you don't have that block of the protein synthesis, you see a very pronounced decay. And so this indicates that uh, the synapses have a short-term decay process, okay? So we have a, a, when we first learn something, those AMPA receptors that are changing um, have a, a tendency to stay put for a short period of time. Um, and then we see again that if you have this uh, protein synthesis dependent process, um, that will stabilize them. And then once things are stabilized, um, they actually stay pretty stable over a relatively long time period, okay? And if we look behaviorally, this is a kind of, classic curve goes back to Ebbinghaus, one of the first people to really study uh, memory uh, retention in, in the 1800s. Um, you see this really precipitous drop off that really seems to reflect the same kind of drop off that you see in the synapses. And so uh, one idea here that makes this connection, it says that, you know, that early part of the uh, memory loss function is due to these kind of synaptic decay processes. So decay is operative very early in coding uh, just due to the nature of how synapses change. But especially once you get past the day, and we think, uh, as we talked about in the sleep chapter, a lot of memory consolidation and formation of, of proteins and kind of locking in of those synaptic changes takes place overnight, that after that point, most of this uh, further kind of uh, reduction in memory level is likely due to interference effects and not decay. A lot of times you have memories that go back 10 years, right, or 20 years. And as you get older, you have a longer window there. Um, I went back to my junior high school uh, and, you know, walked into this courtyard area where we had lunch every day and all these memories came flooding back, right? And so there's a lot of indication that we do retain memories for a really long time, even if we haven't really thought about them in the interim. And, uh, and so that suggests that in fact, those synapses, those synaptic changes are still sort of hiding out there somewhere. And, and so we do have a long-term memory. And if there was a lot of decay, uh, then it would, seems implausible that you would have a decay rate that would kind of uh, be meaningful at the level of like 20 years. Like what is a decay rate such that the memory is actually still there after 20 years? It's got to be such a tiny decay rate that it's basically meaningless. Um, and that most of our uh, 
our loss of memory again is this inability to get back to those original memories, uh, the temporal context having drifted. Um, and, and that's why, in fact, going back to a spatial context that uh, like when I went back to my junior high school, um, that powerful spatial cues, seeing that, that place, uh, the, that, that layout, the, all, the, all the aspects of the space there um, was such a powerful retrieval cue um, because of that importance of space and context for our memory encoding. So there's this urban legend that you never forget anything. Uh, everything's sort of encoded somewhere in your brain. And, and to some extent that I think that is true that, you know, there is interference that things synapses do get, uh, updated and, and to some extent overwritten with new knowledge. Uh, but some things stay put in there and, and their synapses amazingly can maintain those synaptic changes over really long time periods. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the nature of this interference. The most common form of interference is this kind of retroactive interference. And this is uh, where that new learning, learning some new information sort of overwrites, interferes with, uh, ruins the retro, the old uh, knowledge. So new overwrites old, um, and that's really a function of synapses that were changed to adapt for encoding you know some original memory pattern now those things get shifted in a new way with new patterns of activity coming in and kind of overwrite those prior uh, synaptic weight changes and that's really the typical form of interference there's a, a much uh, less common but very fascinating form of interference called proactive interference where you actually have interference with trying to learn new information uh, based on some pre prior existing activity or, or knowledge in your brain. And so uh, one thing that happens to me sometimes is I just feel like that uh, when I see some person, I just think that I think I know what their name is. Um, who knows why uh, they just seem like that kind of person or something. I have no idea. But then it's hard for me to learn uh, a new name uh, for them if I think that I already know their existing name. Uh, so maybe that might happen to you when you get older. So that's an example of proactive interference. Okay, let's talk about false memories. You may not know about this or remember this, but there was a huge uh, surge in lawsuits associated with repressed memories um, that took place here in this graph. You can see in the early 90s, there was kind of a, a big flurry of cases that where people seem to remember uh, traumatic events from their childhood and then uh, went about kind of suing uh, the perpetrators of these kind of traumatic events. Um, and part of this was kind of potentially not veridical, right? And so there was a sense in which uh, therapists and, and people were recovering memories that didn't actually exist. Some of them, of course, were real. Um, and that's, of course, the really tricky nature of memory is, of course, distinguishing the real memories from the false memories, but we do have plenty of evidence that you can have these false memories. I personally have had this experience where my wife has told this story over and over again, and I was sure that that, that event had happened to me um, because I'd heard that same story so many times. I really had that mental image of it, and I really thought this was my memory. <laughs> so here's your Dilbert cartoon uh, with the same kind of thing here with the dog trying to implant this uh, false memory into poor Dilbert. And then if we look more seriously at uh, in the legal world, eyewitness testimony and the, the kind of lineup of possible suspects that you see, the usual suspects, all these kind of classic uh, lineup kind of photos um, and having people try to pick out the, the perpetrator, um, that is notoriously unreliable, okay? There's lots and lots of evidence that people's memory uh, seems much more uh, subjectively accurate than it actually is. And so you have people, especially in a traumatic case of a, of a crime, having these really strong feelings of, of having remembered something, they're wrong, right? The memory system is up at this very high level in the brain. It's encoding things. It's subject to all the biases that we have, which is often leading to, you know, misattribution along stereotype uh, grounds, et cetera. Um, and if you look at the actual data here, about 75% of cases uh, that were later overturned on DNA evidence were due to eyewitness misidentification. So this is a very, very significant real world problem. 
And I think people just don't understand that you can have a really compelling subjective memory feeling that is actually inaccurate, especially in uh, highly emotionally charged situations. One of the most uh, uh, widely studied examples of false memory is this dies rodiger mcdermott paradigm, DRM. And again, because of the important implications of false memory, having a reliable way to induce false memories in the lab uh, has been a very useful tool. And in this case, you study all these different words, which kind of lie around a central concept, so to speak, of sleep in this case. And so uh, you never actually see the word sleep on this list of words, um, but you study all these other words and then you're asked, you know, was this word on the list? And, uh, you know, you, you have a very high chance of false alarming and saying, I recognize this word sleep from the list. It wasn't on the list, but you really think it was. And we can understand this in terms of the neural mechanisms, uh, in terms of uh, just overlap of the neural activity patterns associated with each of these different concepts. And so essentially, uh, if you picture like a, a, a Venn diagram kind of thing of overlapping circles, all these concepts have essentially activated all those different populations of neurons that encode this information. And so in some sense, the neurons that make up the, your, your internal representation of the concept of sleep have all been activated to some extent in these different memories. And so when you get this pattern of activity coming in for sleep, um, it, it really does seem like a familiar concept because you have uh, activated and encoded all those related ones. Okay, and lastly, well, let's talk about uh, this difference we talked about at the, at the start in terms of working memory versus short-term memory. And so working memory is a specific subtype, if you will, of short-term memory um, that's associated with activity in the prefrontal cortex. And it reflects kind of the active contents of what you're working on as a kind of task level thing. And we've talked many times about how the prefrontal cortex is really important for keeping you on task, keeping you focused. It's the part of the brain that falls asleep when you're, when you're dreaming. And it's so hard to stay on task when you're asleep and dreaming. Um, and that's really a reflection of that contribution of the prefrontal cortex. Because of certain properties of the circuitry and prefrontal cortex, this reverberation of neural activity that we think is going on with short-term memory can be particularly robust. And, and these cells can really maintain that pattern of activity over time in a way that you just don't get uh, in other parts of the brain. And we will pick up on this idea in the next chapter and understand this kind of core contribution of working memory as a memory system uh, in prefrontal cortex as critical for uh, being able to do these kinds of you know, mental arithmetic and other kinds of internal kind of computational tasks, complex cognitive tasks. Uh, and we can see how this plays out in the concept of uh, general fluid intelligence and all these other implications. But basically it, it really ties right back into this kind of notion of active neural firing and special circuits that are important for being able to do this active neural firing.